In this sermon, we highlight three aspects of who Jesus Christ really is and what these mean personally to you and me. In our Christmas time, of course, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, we take time to sing those carols and uh, have those meals with the families and, and do all those nice things that, uh, that just is a celebration of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we reflect back, we think about, we thank God, we praise God for uh, God coming into this world. And yet, in many of our minds, and even for those outside, sometimes we may not really understand the one whom we are celebrating. And we sometimes still think about Christmas we think about Christmas as something all about a baby in a manger. Or we think about some great person who lived 2,000 years ago and for some reason we're just celebrating his life or who he is or who he was. And that's the way most of the world thinks about Christmas. In fact, most of the world don't even, doesn't even think about the Christ in Christmas. We forget about Christ. We just have Christmas. We try to have Christmas without Christ. And you know, when many people think about the Lord Jesus Christ, many are quick to acknowledge or willing to acknowledge His greatness as a teacher, His greatness as a leader, His greatness as maybe even a revolutionary, somebody who created or uh, uh, caused a revolution that continues on has left a legacy and so it continues on till today. Or many are willing to acknowledge him as probably a founder of some, of a religion, religious, religious leader. Some even recognize him as a martyr, somebody who was willing to die for something he stood for, something he spoke about. So they consider him as a martyr. Now here's the thing, while all of this is good, if all we do is recognize only this much about Jesus, we still haven't recognized who he really is. We missed his true identity, missed who he really is. So this morning, I want to bring our attention to just three simple aspects about Christ. Who is this Christ that we are celebrating this morning? Just three simple and yet very essential aspects, very important aspects of who Jesus Christ is. And if we miss these, though we may acknowledge all the others, we've actually missed the Christ of Christmas. Because these three are very important for us. So we go back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say about this Christ whom we are celebrating this Christmas? What does the Bible really say? Who is he really? The first very important aspect of Jesus Christ, which we must acknowledge and embrace, if we really want to celebrate the Christ of Christmas, is that Jesus Christ is Creator God. So this baby in a manger, this man from Galilee, this religious leader, this great martyr, this revolutionary, this prophet, this great teacher is way beyond that. He is creator God. And the Bible, the scriptures are very, very clear in that. And these are verses that are familiar to you and, my, you and me. Those of us who have attended church for a while, you'll be familiar with these scriptures John 1 verses 1 to 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Very clear. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So here is this Word, this eternal Word, who now becomes flesh, as it says later on. But this Word was God, and all things were made by Him. He's creator. So he's not just a baby in a manger. 
He's a baby in a manger for us to, you know, look at that. His physical birth, but he's way beyond that. He's creator God. Colossians, Paul writes in Colossians, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth. I mean, we're talking about somebody who created everything. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. That is, even before the baby was born, he was there. Before all things. And by him, everything is held together. Everything has its meaning, purpose, and origin. Before all things. And even today, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that he upholds everything by his powerful words. So he is the sustainer, the regulator, the upholder of everything. Christ, Jesus Christ, is creator God. That's whom we're celebrating this Christmas. For our finite mind, for us to understand, for us to comprehend, he came as a man, born as a baby, and so on. But beyond, he's beyond that. He is creator God. And so this morning, and this Christmas season, as we worship Jesus I want you and me to recognize this aspect of who Christ is, creator God. What does that mean to you and me personally? As creator, we have to acknowledge that he is eternal, he's all-powerful, he's infinite. When we talk about this baby in a manger, it's not this little cuddly thing that I hold. <laughs> hey, you're talking about somebody who's all-powerful, he's infinite. He's eternal. As creator God, he is to be worshipped and honored by all of his creation. Subjects worship or honor their king. People honor their presidents or their leaders. How much more should creation, created beings, honor their creator, worship their creator? As creator, he is a reason for all creation, our purpose and our meaning flows out of him. Like the Bible says, all things were made through him, for him. In him everything consists. And when we look at Christ as creator God, meaning and purpose flows out of him. And you know, this is a big thing in life today. People are searching for meaning, purpose. Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? But it all comes when we connect to our creator God. Because in him, all things consist. So when you connect, that's when meaning flows and purpose flows into our lives. As creator, our lives must be devoted to bring him pleasure. Like Revelation 4.11 says in the King James, all things were created for your pleasure, to bring him pleasure. So as creator God, I relate to him and say, God, you are creator. I want to make sure my life brings you pleasure. Would you please with my life, with what I do? And as creator, we recognize there's nothing impossible for him. So what is it that you're going through today? What are the challenges you're facing? What are the impossibilities before you? And you're connected with creator God, with Jesus Christ. There's nothing impossible. All things are made through him. So the small things that you and I struggle with in life, He's more than able to handle. He's more than able to resolve. He's more than able to break through. He's more than able to change. He's creator God. That's whom we are talking about. The second aspect that you and I must recognize about Jesus is that he is our redeemer. Again, this is very important. Even if you believe in Christ as a historical reality, even if you believe and accept that he was crucified, on the cross. But if you look at his crucifixion on the cross as martyrdom and not redemption, you've missed the whole thing. That's not what it's all about. Oh, he was martyred for teaching some great things or for being a revolutionary or causing some sort of a rebellion. No, 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 no. He is redeemer. His death had great meaning, great purpose, great significance. More than just being martyred him. 
He is Redeemer. What does it mean to redeem? It means to, to set free, to liberate, to bring us out of what we are enslaved under and to take us up to what we really ought to be, to bring us to a higher place, to redeem. He came to redeem us. Tomorrow when we have our Christmas service, I'll talk about the reason for creation, uh, for incarnation, the reason for the incarnation. Why did God have to become a man in order to redeem? I mean, couldn't he have just sat in heaven and said, I redeem all of you? Peaceful, it all got done. Why did he have to become this baby in Bethlehem? Why did he have to become this man from Galilee in order to redeem? We'll answer that tomorrow. The reason for the incarnation. Why couldn't he have just said, I forgive all of you? You're all forgiven. Problem solves. Why did he have to become a man and die on the cross? What's the reason for the incarnation? And the questions that can come out of that where, well, does it mean that we, if he came as an incarnate son of God to the Jewish people, does it mean that he also comes as an incarnate God to all the other people groups? Do they all have their own incarnations of God? And if he came as an incarnate God, as incarnate God at a particular point in time, does it mean that he has to come again and again and again? And again? Is, this, is this a recurring thing over time? Is that a necessity? Or is one incarnation sufficient? We'll answer that tomorrow. So make sure you come back. <laughs> just okay. But the point is this. He is Redeemer. That's who he is. That's what the Bible calls him and that's what he came to do. He came to set us free from everything that enslaved us in order to lift us up to a level that he desired for us. Here are just some scriptures. Galatians 1.4 says, He came to redeem us from this present evil age. So whatever is in this age evil that is trying to oppress you, suppress you, torment you, trouble you, He came to set you and me free from it. Titus 2.14 says he came to redeem us from every lawless deed, every sinful deed. So whatever sinful deed it is that tries to enslave you, he came to set you and me free from it so we can live above it. Came to redeem us. Hebrews 2.14.15 verse 14 says he came to deliver us from the power of the devil. So even the devil no longer can suppress, oppress, control us because he came to redeem us from the devil. And verse 15 there says, he came to redeem us from fear, the fear of death, the fear of darkness. And people, because of fear, are in bondage, enslaved. So I've come to set you free. I've come to be a redeemer. So he came to redeem us. So here's the thing. If you want to look at it like this, you and I, we owed a great debt which we could not pay. So in the court of heaven, my credit card was overused. <laughs> it was never paid. I could never pay any part of it. Huge debt. Huge debt. I could never pay. And because of my debt, I was therefore legally enslaved to all kinds of things. Sin, sickness, Satan, everything. The evil in this world. I was a slave. I was in debt. But Jesus came to pay my debts. To bring me out, therefore, because my debt is paid, I'm now brought out of every enslavement that came over my life. Same thing for you and me. He came to pay our debts and bring us out from everything that enslaved us, oppressed us, tormented us. So we have redemption through his blood, as the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 7. Now, as Redeemer, understand that he is the only Redeemer you and I have. The only Redeemer. Because no, he was not just a philosopher. There, are, there have been many great philosophers, many great teachers. 
many great religious leaders, but there's only one redeemer. Jesus Christ. One redeemer. And as redeemer, you and I must believe and receive by faith what he has done for us. Believe and receive. Embrace that. He's my redeemer. I'll receive what he's done for me. And then you and I can experience his redemption. The last thing, the third aspect that I want to just present to you and me, which many times people miss in this whole thing about trying to understand who Jesus Christ is, is that Jesus Christ is our friend. Meaning, he didn't come to be this great philosopher who could give you good ideas. Or this great teacher who can teach you nice things. That you keep reading his learn writings or his, his sayings and try to learn new things. He came to have a very personal relationship with you and me. He came to be our friend. Now, creator God, redeemer, and yet your friend, my friend. That word friend is just used to describe the kind of relationship he wants with you and me. That free-flowing, close relationship. It's not sacrilegious to say that creator God is also my friend. Amen? Creator God is also your friend. Redeemer is also your friend. Your friend. That close relationship. This is how he put it across to his disciples, and he, I'm sure he would say that same thing to you and me in John 14, verses 13 to 15. He says, greater love has no one than this, that a man laid down, than to lay down his life, one's life for his friends. In other words, this, this is the greatest demonstration of love, and that's what I'm doing for you. I'm going to lay down my life for you, because I want you as my friends. And then he says in verse 14, you are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. And verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all things that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. Here's what Jesus is saying. Look, I want you, if I want to, if I want to paraphrase these three words, I would do it like this. Jesus is saying to you and me, I desperately want to be a friend, and I'm willing to give my life for it. That's how much. I want you to be my friend. That's how much I want me to be your friend. How, have this friendship relationship with you. I'm willing to pay for that. So it's not a casual thing. It says, I've given my life in order to establish a friendship relationship with you. And then he says, you know, when you obey me, don't do it out of fear. But do it because of friendship. Yes, I am creator God. And yes, as created beings, we reverence, we have fear of God. But he says, when you obey me, do it because of a friendship relationship. Amen? You know, if you're a really close friend with someone, and when he asks you some, of you something, you do it because of that friendship. He says, can you come and pick me up? Sure, I'll do it. Why? Because of that relationship. Because of, he's a friend. So Jesus says, I want you to obey me because of this relationship we have. A friendship relationship. And on his part, he says in verse 15, because I'm your friend, I'm going to give you the secrets of my heart. I will speak to you. And reveal the very things the Father is speaking to me. I'm not going to keep you in the dark. Where you don't know things that you need to know. I will speak them to you. I'm your friend. Amen. So who is this Jesus we are celebrating this Christmas season? Far beyond all the historic, historical things about him. He is created God. He's our redeemer. He's our friend. How do you relate to him as a friend? As a friend, 
He invites us into a personal relationship with Him. I mean, there's a relationship, a real personal, something that you have, I have, with Jesus Christ. And He wants that for each one of us. And we all long for these relationships. And nothing can be as wonderful as that personal relationship with our Creator God and our Redeemer Himself. As our friend, He transforms our lives. All friends have an influence on you. Companions influence behavior. Now Jesus Christ, as our friend, influences us to the point of transformation. Transforms us. The closer you get to him, the more he changes you and me. As our friend, he journeys with us. He's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He's with us through all that life brings, the ups and the downs, the, the good times and the bad times. He's our friend. As our friend, he speaks his counsel to us as he promised. And as our friend, he works with us and through us. So, this morning as we close, just three simple but yet very important aspects of Jesus Christ. Creator, Redeemer, and friends. But you and I need to embrace this. We need to respond to this. And I close with this family of us in John 3, 16 and 17. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that people in the world could have Christmas every year. <laughs> That's not the reason why he gave his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Why? So that Whoever believes in him, that means you believe in him for who he is. Believe in him as creator God. Believe in him as your redeemer. Believe in him as your friends. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but experience eternal life, which he came to give you and me. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So I want to invite you and me. I know many of us already believe in Jesus Christ personally. Many of us seated here, we already recognize and acknowledge him as our creator God, as our redeemer, as our friends. But if there is anyone here, maybe you're visiting, maybe you've been invited by a, someone and you've come here this morning and in your personal life, in your own personal faith, you never believed in Jesus Christ for who he, he is, who he really is. Not just the baby in the manger, but as creator God, as the one who came to set you free, as your personal friend. If you never believed in him as the one who, your redeemer, the one who died for your sins on the cross, who was buried, who rose up again, who is alive today, and he is more than able to redeem your life. From the evil that's in this age, from every sinful deed, from every oppression of the devil, from every fear that might enslave you, he's more than able, he's waiting to do it. And if you've never believed in Jesus Christ personally, then I want to help you do that this morning. That this year, Christmas, can be the year when you really believed in the Christ. And you welcomed him into your life. Asked him to make you a brand new person, to transform you inside out, and to give you eternal life. If you've never done that, I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. I'm going to ask the worship team to please come up. I'm going to ask us to please stand to our feet as we... Take a few more moments to pray and then we will close and dismiss.
If there's anyone here this morning. You enjoyed many Christmases in your life. Christmases have come and gone. But this morning, how about encountering the Christ of Christmas? The creator, the redeemer, the friend. Your creator, your redeemer, your friend. So what should I do? The Bible says, he came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. But to as many as who received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. So you must receive him. Meaning you welcome him and you believe in him as your creator. I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. We're going to pray together. And if you've never done this in your life, I'm going to ask you to do that with me this morning. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if there's anyone here this morning that you've never personally received or embraced Jesus Christ for who he is, but this morning you say, yes, I want to believe in Christ this Christ of Christmas, this Jesus for who he really is. I feel it tug in my heart. I want to receive him for what he came to do for me personally, to be my redeemer, to be my friend. I want to receive him into my life. And I want you to pray this prayer with me, please. If you've never done this before, would you say this with me? Lord Jesus, I receive you into my life. I acknowledge you as creator, as my redeemer, and as my friend. I believe you died for me on the cross. Wash me from my sin. Be my Lord and my Savior. And help me follow you the rest of my life. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at abcwo.org also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.